Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you very much for coming for the launch of this uh, new report, uh, which is our second such report, second World Intellectual Property Report. Our first one, some of you may remember, was published two years ago, which was innovation, uh, on innovation. It was the changing face of innovation. And our objective with this uh, series of report is to be able to try to provide some fresh insights into uh, uh, different elements of intellectual property, but also to encourage uh, evidence-based policy making or empirically-based policy making. Uh, this year, the report, as you can see, is on brands, reputation and image in the global uh, marketplace. And we are very pleased with this report. We're very proud of this report. We think that it contains, and as the work done by Carsten Fink, our chief economist, and his colleagues, uh, uh, one of whom is here, Sasha von Svinson, um, we think it contains very many interesting findings, uh, not the least of which is uh, new figures on branding investments worldwide, which uh, we estimate at nearly 500 billion. Uh, per annum. I'll come back to that in a, in a uh, little while. But uh, that sh indication uh, shows that um, branding investments account for about 25% of all corporate investments in intangible assets. And corporate investments in intangible assets include, as you know, research and development, software design and other matters but branding up to 25%, which is quite significant. Now, why did we choose uh, to do the report on brands uh, this time? Uh, well, there, it, it may be banal to say it, but brands, of course, are um, an indispensable guide for consumers. Uh, they incarnate the image and the reputation of an enterprise and they are one of an enterprise's most valuable intangible assets or most valuable assets. Uh, and they're important signalling mechanisms in the economy, joining consumers and producers. Um, all enterprises, whether small or medium or large, use brands to commercialise their goods and services. So this is something that is totally pervasive in the economy. Uh, and trademarks, which are the legal protection for brands or the legal expression of brands, if you like, uh, brands are the commercial notion and trademarks are the legal expression of brands. Uh, trademarks are the most, by far the most widely used form of intellectual property. So clearly it's an important area, but it has not received in the past the same amount of attention as, for example, patents uh, and the relationship between patents and innovation. So we hope that this uh, report will advance our understanding of the economic role in particular and the commercial role of branding. What are some of the report's main findings? Um, well, we think that uh, the report makes a contribution towards measuring companies' investments in branding. I have already mentioned that. But we think this is one of the contributions that the report makes. That's not an easy exercise, how to measure how much is invested in branding. You can't rely only on uh, expenditure on uh, advertising. Uh, and on the other hand, you can't spread the net too widely because in a certain sense, all corporate communications um, have something to do with branding, uh, and so you have to find a happy medium in the measurement exercise. But there are three findings, three empirical findings, <coughs> in the report which we think stand out. Uh, and they are, uh, first of all, as I have mentioned, worldwide, we estimate that companies invest $466 billion dollars, US dollars, on branding, and that was those are figures for the year 2011. Uh, secondly, uh, if you were to look at uh, the United States of America, for example, um, they have figures which are more complete and more, more full data 
Uh, and those figures in the US show that uh, branding, investments in branding in the year 2010 amounted to some 340 billion US dollars in the US alone. Uh, and that's twice as much as previous in, uh, estimates indicated. Um, and it exceeds, by the way, the amount that US companies invest in research and development or design. And it's about a quarter of their intangible asset investments. And thirdly, we think an interesting finding is that while uh, branding investments correlate generally with uh, level of economic development, we find that uh, the rapidly growing middle income economies, such as China and India, are investing more in branding than the high income in, uh, countries did when they were at a comparable stage of development. Lastly, let me come to uh, the role of trademarks in this, in particular as the legal uh, protection of brands or the legal expression of brands. Uh, as I said, it's the most widely used form of intellectual property in the world. Um, in 2001, China uh, became the top recipient of trademark filings, the biggest, if you like, trademark office in the world. Uh, you can compare that with their achievement of that status in the patent area in 2011. So in branding area, they achieved it uh, in the trademark area much earlier, 2001, compared to 2011. Uh, we would point out that trademark demand, that's the number of applications for trademarks worldwide, trebled, uh, quad, sorry, quadrupled over the last 25 years. So uh, the number of trademark applications annually, globally, went up four times uh, over the last 25 years. In, 2000, in 1985, there was just under 1 million trademark applications filed worldwide. In 2011, 4.2 million. Uh, and we think there are a number of factors that uh, account for this, and those factors are analysed and discussed in the report. They include internationalisation of brands, growing importance of the service sector and the risks of uh, brand misappropriation on the internet. Uh, finally, let me just say one word about branding and innovation. Um, the evidence suggests that the companies that invest uh, heavily in branding are often the most highly innovative companies. So uh, branding is a very important element of an innovation ecosystem, a vibrant innovation in ecosystem. Uh, and obviously companies can increase the demand for their products through branding. Uh, and the report discusses some evidence that shows that branding is one of the most important mechanisms for companies to secure uh, returns on product innovation. Uh, I'll stop there and I would like to uh, hand the floor to Carsten Fink, our Chief Economist. Thank you very much, Director General. Um, I don't have um, anything to add on the main findings of the report. Uh, let me just highlight a number of other topics uh, that the report covers and on which we would be happy to elaborate. Um, first, the report offers a review of how globalization and technology have shaped branding strategies uh, throughout history. Among other things, uh, the report describes how brands more easily transcend national borders, uh, how there's greater brand diversity, more brands uh, from, from middle-income countries in particular. It discusses how technology has led brands to communicate through an increasing number of interactive channels and how branding is no longer the purview of companies alone. Um, increasingly, individuals, civil society organizations, government agencies, nations as a whole, even us international organizations, uh, are taking an active approach uh, to branding. 
Secondly, the report uh, looks at so-called markets for brands. Uh, think of international restaurant franchises or Disney characters appearing on T-shirts, for example. Through markets for brands, companies can generate new revenues without substantial investments in building or acquiring new man manufacturing capability. We look at the limited data available on markets for brands to characterize uh, um, um, those markets. Third, the report offers an in-depth analysis of trademark policy, focusing in particular on the design of the trademark uh, registration process, uh, where different countries uh, have uh, pursued different approaches. It points to the possible risk of trademark cluttering, essentially national trademark uh, registries growing to the point where there is a diminished availability of names and other signs available for new trademarks. It also discusses uh, a number of specific policy choices, such as the requirement to use trademarks in common, commerce and the extent to which uh, offices substantively examine uh, trademark applications. And finally, the report asks at what point strong brands can raise competition concerns, uh, while strong brand reputation is in most cases consistent uh, with healthy competition and to the benefit of consumers, there are circumstances where competition authorities uh, have assessed the competitive consequences of strong brand reputation and have at times intervened, for, for example, in cases of mergers and acquisitions. Um, so these are just some of the other elements uh, that are discussed in the report. Let me stop here, um, but we would be happy to answer any questions you may have on the report. Thank you. And do you have some uh, uh, Russian news agency that has any news? And do you have some special statistics about Russia because you are mentioned in China and you are mentioned in India? And uh, another question, uh, you, you write that the middle income, share of middle income economies uh, increased from 6 to 9 percent between 0, 9 and 30. Uh, how do you see the perspectives? Uh, will the share be bigger and what's your explanation? Well, look, first on Russia, I suppose one thing that we could point you to uh, in the data is um, that in our Madrid system, okay, International Trademark Registration System, Russia is, and we'll, and we'll verify this, but uh, I'm going from memory, the second most designated or the third most designated uh, country. Now, what that means is... Uh, that people applying for trademark protection consider the Russian market, you know, uh, to be the third most interesting, if you like, in the world. From memory, I think China is first, mm -hmm. and the European Union may be second, uh, and I think Russia third. So uh, we'll, we we can verify that, but that's some uh, evidence. Do you have other? Um, yeah, the one answer? data point I can give you. Um, um, as uh, the Director General described, uh, we produced a global, global estimate of branding investments uh, that relied on data um, uh, for more than 60 countries. Uh, Russia is among them. Uh, in the case of Russia uh, for 2011, which is the, year, the latest year for which we have available data, um, we estimate that um, branding investments uh, amount uh, to 7.5 billion uh, US dollar uh, in, in Russia. Um, interestingly, um, in absolute terms, that is, of course, less than in the case of China, which is uh, alone explained by the fact that uh, China has a larger economy. But in relation, uh, or as a proportion of GDP, um, it is actually larger. In the case of Russia, branding investments account for 0.4% um, of GDP. In the case of China, the figure stands at 0.3% uh, uh, of, of GDP, um, if, if these numbers are helpful. Um, we would also be able, uh, but you know, that we wouldn't uh, uh, um, be able to do immediately, you know, to sort of look at trends uh, in the case of Russia and see how that figure um, has, has evolved over time. Ashish, thank you. Mm. 
you can take that, I think, here. Yeah. I think it's a good question, and I think, uh, um, you know, that in some sense also highlights the contribution that we try to make in this report. Uh, there have been, uh, you know, previously estimates out there on, on advertising expenditure. Um, what we did is um, to um, take the investment approach, and the investment approach, you know, very much asked what kind of expenditure, first of all, relates to branding, and that clearly goes beyond advertising, you know, that... Uh, uh, includes uh, market research, it includes strategic communication, a number of other components that you would find uh, in, in, in the report. Um, and also, secondly, um, we recognize that uh, not all expenditures necessarily have a long-lasting impact on how brands are perceived. Uh, so we apply certain depreciation methods uh, to really come up with an investment uh, estimate. And the reason we do so, um, and you know, that has been done in a number of countries and for the United States so we can do this, that enables us to comp compare investments in branding uh, to um, investments in other intangible assets, we, which give you a sense of you know, how important um, you know, is branding in terms of you know, all the intangible um, assets that, that a company uh, possesses. And, and you know, at least we have learned uh, quite a bit uh, through this exercise. Catherine, then Ravi, après. One, two, three. Catherine says, Ravi, if you want. I have two questions. The first one is the issue of uh, non-traditional trademarks. So I looked in the report, I'm not sure I found anything on this. So I would like to know um, if they follow the same trends as uh, traditional trademarks. Are they used the same way? In the I don't think we have any data on that. Question. The second question is that the difference of protection between GIs and trademarks, GIs being protected with special sujuary system in some countries, and certification mark in some other countries and there are tension between those two so does the report give any yeah. indication of how we can be compromised? Yeah. No, it's not a legal report, it's an economic report. So we're not really looking at uh, you know uh, the all of the different mechanisms that can be used to uh, provide some legal protection for brands. Trademarks are the main ones. GIs, as you say, are also um, um, very important. Company name registration is a form of branding in a certain sense as well. So we're not uh, the the purpose of the report is not really legal analysis and looking at uh, at uh, the legal impact of the differing branding systems. Likewise, for non-traditional marks. Uh, we haven't really uh, analysed that in detail here as a separate area uh, for the same reason, that we're really looking at a, a, a first analysis of the economic impact and role of branding. Ravi. So today I haven't read your report. It takes some time to absorb and comprehend the findings. But I just want to re revert to a development which has taken place over the last 24 hours, namely about the WikiLeaks, the IPR chapter in the TPP, and uh, the 87 page or, yeah. or document basically points to most of the uh, your uh, sort of treaties and agreements. And I just read a couple of reports like Sydney today. Basically, says that this has a very uh, adverse and negative effect on a range of IPR issues, particularly in the patent side, medicines, copyrights. And would you like to reflect on this and what are your ideas? Yeah. Look, um, I can't obviously because I first I haven't seen any draft. It's all on the web. Uh, yes, I know, but I haven't seen any official draft. Uh, uh, what, it was put out by a state? No, put out by a wiki. Yeah, okay. So uh, I haven't seen any official draft, uh, first of all. Um, and as far as I am aware, states have not chosen to uh, to communicate any official draft of, of the state of the TPP talks. Uh, so I'm unable to take official cognizance of any 
exi the existence of any uh, instrument uh, in the first place. Secondly, this is a, 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 an arrangement between a limited number of states, all of whom happen to be members of both the multilateral organisation of WIPO and the multilateral organisation of WTO. But we have nothing to say about what individual groupings of our member states may do between themselves, obviously. I mean, we can't. Uh, it's up to them to do... Uh, they, they may do what they wish. Uh, and before we would take any position, not that I think that we will be taking any position, but before we could take any position, I think we'd, we would need to see what is the officially communicated instrument as agreed, as opposed to a text which is, first of all, not official, but secondly, not agreed. You know, And I think that one of the reasons why states don't necessarily communicate texts under negotiation is because they want that liberty to be able to, you know, find out uh, test positions before they are able to uh, come to a result about it. So I can't have any position on the contents. Mm. But uh, can I just follow up with what you said? Uh, namely, uh, I agree that it's not an official text because it mm. has just been put out by human beings. Going through the text itself, whatever is official or non-official status, uh, basically what appears is that there seems to be a move to undermine the minimum common standards that you have at the World Trade Organization. Yes. Would this pose a problem? Would your own agreements pose increasingly a problem to undermining what are the minimum standards? Well, I can't uh, agree with that characterization because uh, I haven't, you know, taken cognizance of an official text, so I can't agree with the characterization that you give it. Um, I don't have any comment before we uh, could see any official text. All I would say is that if you look around the world now, the environment for intellectual property is much more complex than it used to be. Uh, much more complex. So. If you look around the world, you see very active national agendas. You see very a a active bilateral programs. You see active plurilateral programs. TPP is one uh, uh, such instance. But you also have uh, proposed negotiations for the, now I've forgotten its acronym, it's the TP, what is it? The TPP. TPP. Yeah, there we are. There we are. So uh, this, is a f this is a fact. You know, you have this complexity of the environment now, which you may not have had 20 years ago. And one can ask the question, why uh, has this complexity arisen? And one of the reasons is, I think, because uh, the field of intellectual property is of more importance. Uh, it represents greater economic value than perhaps it used to, and it's more central to the economic system than it used to be. And another reason is because of globalization. I think states and the enterprises and individuals in states are drawn into much closer relationships, which naturally brings about, I think, uh, a much more complex environment for discussing, uh, for uh, determining what the rules will be governing those interrelationships in a more interconnected world. So. There, we, this is a fact that we have a complex environment now, and this is one feature of it. And our business is the multilateral part of it and not the plurilateral parts, which is the member states' business. Yes, and then the. Oui, bien sûr. J'ai une question concernant la page 43. Oui. <rire> Vous parlez 31, c'est. Je regarde le chiffre de la France, c'est les 31, 31 marques les plus connues, c'est ça Et où est-ce que vous pouvez avoir la liste de ces marques C'est bien ça que ça veut dire euh, Brands emanating from my community. Les chiffres qui sont dans le calendrier, c'est les marques les plus connues. 
Est-ce que je peux répondre en anglais So what we do in the report, we look at um, uh, three private estimates of companies' brand values. Uh, you know, these are not our estimates. Uh, these are values that uh, come from uh, three companies. Uh, one is called Interbrand. Uh, a second one is called, uh, I think, Brand Brand Z. Brand Z. And the other one is called Brand Finance, I think. And we, um, you know, those uh, numbers, uh, I believe, are in the public domain. You can uh, actually go to the website uh, of uh, those uh, firms and, and, and consult uh, which brands are in, in the top rankings. Uh, we um, mainly do analysis uh, with uh, those uh, rankings. We compare a little bit the methodology that uh, goes into um, um, calculating uh, private values of brands. Uh, and we analyze, you know, looking at the, in this case, the list of top 500 brands, um, you know, how are they distributed across the world, uh, which countries account for how many brands. And, you know, we have here this distinction between high income and middle income countries. Uh, I have, in fact, and I'm happy to share that with you, um, the list uh, of you know, the um, French brands that have made it into the top 500 rankings uh, with me. Again, these are not our data. You know, um, we mainly use them to you know, look at the methodology and to compare them. But uh, <coughs> this is in the public domain. I would be happy to share that with you. C'est bon? Yeah. Yeah, um, if I may, two questions. I think you partially answered the first one, um, which was uh, how do you measure or how do you estimate the brand value that you have in your table one on page nine? Um, you just told us that, in fact, this is um, a measurement done by outside companies, right? Maybe you can explain what factors are involved with that. And I was wondering to what extent, if any, um, abuse of brands on the internet is a problem uh, in various ways, either registering a, 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 an internet address with a brand name or fake websites and things like that. Uh, do you have any estimates what the losses might be due to that? We don't because it's very difficult to measure that activity, but all of the evidence suggests that it is extremely significant. And what is the evidence? Well, uh, a certain amount of evidence comes from cyber squatting, that is the uh, deliberate bad faith registration as a domain name of a trademark. Uh, so that provides some evidence. A certain amount of evidence comes from court litigation. So you see an active court uh, amount of court litigation on um, uh, the use of uh, trademarks or the misuse of trademarks on the internet. There is quite a significant uh, number of cases that deal with this. And a third uh, source of a certain amount of anecdotal evidence comes from what companies are saying themselves. And what they are saying is that this is a very significant problem for them and it's very, uh, it, it consumes a significant amount of their resources to be able to just <coughs> undertake monitoring of the use or misuse of their brands on the internet. And maybe on the on the first question um, with regard to measuring brand value, I would say that the concept um, I think is well defined, and I think the idea is 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 quite sensible. Um, you know, you look at a telephone like this that um, you know comes with a certain brand, and the idea of measuring brand value is that you compare the price of that telephone to the price of a hypothetical telephone that looks exactly the same, but does not come uh, with with a brand name. And you know, based on the price premium that you calculate. Uh, you can um, infer from that, uh, you know, what is the value of the brand, you know, that um, that that the company um, that sells that particular telephone um, benefits from. Um, so, you know, methodologically, I think, you know, the, the concept is well defined. The tricky thing is, you know, how to estimate that in practice because you precisely don't know the counterfactual. You precisely don't observe, you know, the generic telephones, um, you know, that uh, in some sense would provide the benchmark against which you could calculate brand value. Now, the various companies that provide these um, estimates, you know, they rely on various data sources. They look at uh, companies' uh, accounts, uh, at, at their statements. Um, 
you know, they, they try to infer manufacturing costs and, you know, then uh, try to uh, measure value added due to brands. Uh, I think some of the companies also rely on consumer surveys and consumer perception of brands and combine that with company data. Um, and, you know, really the methodologies, you know, differ quite a bit. Interestingly, if you look at the overall correlation, um, you know, the, the top brands that appear in one list are usually also the top brands that appear in another list, even if the values are not the same and, and, and you know, the exact ranking is not the same, but, you know, there is a reasonably close correlation, I would say. Yes. I was wondering uh, if you also, in your in-depth research, <coughs> look at case studies of uh, rapid brand erosion. Well, let me put it this way. I think the way I would describe our value added here is the following, in a sense that, you know, um, Branding is, is certainly not a new phenomenon. You know, there are lots of, um, you know, social scientists, you know, that have looked at, you know, what makes up for brand values, what are effective branding strategies. Companies, you know, have gained a lot of experience in that. They're specialized consulting firms that stand ready to offer advice uh, on, you know, what particular strategies work best. Our focus here is more on, let's say, the economy-wide uh, wide impact. Uh, and, you know, that's precisely where we feel, you know, there is sort of a lack of evidence. Uh, you know, what is the economy-wide impact of branding? Um, so we see that as our value added. And, you know, while I'm sure there are lots of interesting things that could be said about brand erosions, we probably would, you know, we would have seen that as a little bit outside the scope of our study because, you know... The reason I'm saying sure. is uh, very well, again documented uh, uh, court cases where competitors try to undermine a brand through um, dirty tricks, whatever. Uh, and in a global marketplace, you can right. see your brand right. go down uh, the tube fast. Mm. Right, right. Mm. Mm. And I was wondering if you had some anecdotal evidence of that, because it's certainly appearing in the courtrooms. Mm. Right. No. Not anecdotal elements. I mean, the only thing I can think of, you know, in the area of trademarks, you know, there is this phenomenon of lookalike brands, you know, that, uh, you know, companies uh, try to register trademarks, and the question is, to what extent do they already free ride on existing trademarks? Uh, but, you know, it comes down then to, you know, really question, you know, very specific questions. Is there consumer confusion? You know, is there an attempt to, you know, sort of um, uh, tarnish someone else's brands? And, you know, courts, you know, have reached very complex decisions on that. And I think, you know, this is, this is probably a challenging area for, for courts and, and, you know, for trademark law in general. But it's not something we go, you know, into in depth. Um, we talk a little bit about questions of, of for example, um, brand tarnishment in the report, uh, but but not at great length. Can I say, judging from the uh, evidence in the report, can I say if you want to please your shareholder, you should spend more on branding or advertisement than the uh, research and development. <coughs> Uh, yes, I'm not sure you can say that. <laughs> uh, what you can say is that it seems that those companies that are the most innovative spend a considerable amount of money and invest a lot in branding, which only goes it makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, if you want to sell your product, you, you need to be known. Uh, the product needs to be known, and it's known by its brand. Uh, and um, uh, so it's a fairly uh, natural conclusion which, that uh, we come to. But, but what, what we see is that the size of that investment is significant, mm. very, very significant. Well, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a fair and interesting question. And I think the way we approach it in the report is you know, to ask the question, you know, is branding a complement to innovation or is it really a substitute? Um, you know, can you think of cases where, you know, companies, instead of investing in innovation and coming up with new products, they mainly sort of try to create an image around a particular product uh, and, you know, try to gain uh, market share that way? Now, I would say the overwhelming weight of evidence that we present in the report suggests that the two really are complements, you know, that, that branding really supports innovation efforts and, you know, they're not sort of in, in direct competition with each other. You know, 
having said this, you know, certainly you would find cases, and you know, especially sort of in 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 in, in markets or for products that are relatively mature and where the scope of you know sort of uh, technological improvements is more limited. And, you know, if you think sort of of convenience goods, you know, if you think of chocolate bars, what have you, I think this is the example that is in the report. You know, their branding obviously gains in relative importance, and you know that's you know often the case that then companies sort of try to compete, uh, you know, based on image. But again, I think the overwhelming weight of evidence that we present in the report really suggests that there is a complementary relationship between branding and uh, between innovation. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah, I've got a, another one. Um, you said complementary branding and, and innovation, but we're now seeing, uh, I think, quite a few cases of um, regulatory issues moving into the branding area from the uh, tobacco labelling court cases in many countries, including Australia, uh, and now. Uh, other um, health issues appearing on uh, whether a product has a lot of salt, <coughs> fat, sugar. Mm -hmm. uh, so that could radically change the value of a brand depending on the information that's mandated. Right. Um, right. Did you touch into that? No, we didn't. And, you know, I admits that you know there is a large range i would say of government regulations advertising regulations you know you mentioned uh, public health regulations you know that sort of clearly affect you know how branding uh, can can how companies you know can 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 brand can engage in branding um, the, the focus of this report is, you know, to you know, sort of set the scene by talking about branding relatively broadly, presenting branding investments. I think, as far as sort of the government regulations are concerned, we really focus on the trademark system here. And you know, I fully admit, you know, that's only one aspect related to branding. You know, it's probably the aspect uh, that uh, you know is at the at, at the heart of the work that we do at WIPO. But you know, I think to cover all those possible other government regulations, you know, would probably well, require an, another okay. report. Look, I think it's a different, they're, they're different regulatory mechanisms. <clears throat> the idea of trademark protection is to preserve or <clears throat> uh, to give legal protection to distinctiveness so that there's not confusion in the marketplace between products and between the origins of products. Other regulatory perspectives are different, I think. So, you know, there, there is no doubt a regulatory perspective on obscenity and branding, for example, but that's not of immediate interest to us because what we're concerned with is, is uh, simply the mechanism for creating order in the market by distinguishing between different products and different traders and these different economic agents. Mm. 